And he said something was going to be the essence of my, my talk tonight. He said, I should have paid more attention to my symptoms. I should have paid more attention to my symptoms. That's what we're going to talk about tonight, inshallah. In the 80s, we had the 105th May of New York City. You remember? May Ed Koch. Ed Koch became famous for asking this question. We were together in the television studio. We were doing a program together. He said, Imam Siraj, how am I doing? How am I doing? If you are a Muslim in America, you have to ask yourself the question, how am I doing? As the president of the society, as the imam, the head of the school, the director, as a parent, how am I doing? So what I want to do tonight is a little bit evaluation. I don't see things the way I saw them 20 years ago. I see them differently. In order to see, you, know, you need two things, not one. Number one, you, have, you need eyes to see. If you don't have eyes, you can't see. Having eyes to see is only one part of seeing. The second part is light. If you don't believe me, try seeing in the dark. You can't. Not because you don't have eyes, you have eyes, but there's no light. So it's dark. And you are surrounded with broken glass, ditches. poisonous snakes, scorpions. And then you see yourself cut up, blood all over the place, not because your eyes can't see, but because there's no light. And you fall in the ditch, get bitten, bitten by the poisonous snake, stung by the scorpions. Why? There's no light. Allah put it this way. And we sent down the Torah. Fiha wanur. In it is light. In it is guidance and light. And we sent down to him, Isa alayhi salat wa salam, al injil Fihi hudam wa nur. Thank you. Can you put the sugar in? Cream? Sugar and cream. Yes. In it is guidance and light. And this is what Allah says in Quran it is not their eyes that are blind, but their heart within their souls. So tonight we want to take a look at the condition of the Muslims in America and around the world. If I should have paid more attention to the symptoms, there are four things we have to tackle as Muslims. Number one, ourselves. What's my condition? my own Iman. And it may not be the same way it was yesterday or a year ago or 10 years ago. There's a change and therefore we have to evaluate and look at ourselves to make sure that we're still going on the right path. Number two, your children. What's the condition of our children? Years ago, 10 o'clock news they asked the question. They said, it is 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? We have to ask the same question. In 2019, 
do we know where our children are? Imam, my children are home. No, they're not. They may be in the house, but they ain't home. So number one, you have to be concerned about yourself. And number two, you have to be concerned about your children. Because the Prophet said, Every one of you is a shepherd and held accountable for your flock. And the man is the shepherd in his house. Why shepherd? When the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, uses a word, there's wisdom in it. He said, Allah has never sent a prophet except he sent him first as a shepherd. Every prophet they said, Ya Rasulullah, you too, you were a shepherd? Yes. Why? Because the best training for a human being is first as a shepherd. Because when you study animals, Allah is such a magnificent creator. He made all kinds of animals. He made some animals so big, like the elephant and the bear, who can defend themselves because of their massive size. And then he made some animals that have claws to fight, to attack. And then there are some animals that are not big. They don't have claws, they don't have teeth. But Allah gave them blinding speed and they can get away from the enemies because they can outrun them. And there are some animals that merely flap their wings and they fly away. Allah gave them the ability to defend themselves or to get away. There are some animals who bury themselves in the earth. Some animals have shells, and they, when they attack, they go into the shells. Some animals can climb up the tree and run away. Other animals, the only defense they have is that they camouflage themselves so that the animal can't see them because they take the same uh, color of the environment. But the sheep, ah, but the sheep. How many of you made pilgrimage to Mecca? Raise your hand. Excellent. How many want to make it? Ya Rabb, help them to make it. How many of you personally sacrifice a sheep? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Keep them up. Those who said they sacrifice a sheep, if Allah told you to sacrifice a lion, how many would have done it? Huh? Listen, I got a psychiatrist who will talk to you later, right? Thanks be to Allah, he didn't tell us to sacrifice a lion. Because most of us cannot. But the sheep is easy. It stayed right there. You sacrifice it, it stayed right there. I never forget when I sacrificed my, my sheep, it looked at me, I looked at it. I said, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. He didn't run away. Notice how slow the sheep is. No blinding speed. Look at the teeth of the sheep. The sheep is the most vulnerable animal. And even as the sheep is a vulnerable animal, so are our children. So we are shepherds, and you have to watch the sheep. How are we doing? I've come to the conclusion, and this is my opinion, this is not the opinion of the imam or the director or the, or the president, this is my personal opinion. Number one, yourself. Number two, your children. Number three, the ummah. You must be concerned about yourself, your children, and the ummah. As the Prophet والسلام, raised his hand and said, Allahumma ummati ummati, Allahumma ummati ummati wa bakah. The Prophet raised his hand and said, Allah, my ummah, my ummah, and then he started to cry. And Allah sees everything. He tells Jibril, Ya Jibril, idhab ila Muhammad fa as'alhu ma yubkika. Oh Muhammad, go, oh Jibril, go to Muhammad and ask him, why is he crying? 
You know why he's crying? He's crying for the ummah. So after you make sure that you straight, your iman is good, your children is good, you have to worry about the ummah, the community, the Muslims. And number four, we have to be concerned about mankind. After all, this is why Allah sent the prophets. He sent the prophets to the people. And you know what? You have to be concerned. In my opinion, two things show the health, good health, of a Muslim community. Both of them, this is my opinion. Again, it's not the opinion of the center. Number one, children. When you start looking in the masjid and you see the children are gone, where are the children? Your community is on its way down. I gave a talk to a masjid in um, Detroit. It's the oldest masjid in Detroit. When I say the oldest masjid in Detroit, it has two meanings. Meaning number one, it's the first masjid. No masjid before, the oldest masjid. And number two, literally the oldest masjid. This masjid in Detroit, where I gave a talk, is called the geriatric masjid. The geriatric masjid. Average age of the worshiper in that masjid, 80 years old. Sooner or later, it's gone, it's finished. Because there's no youth. Look at your communities. Are the youth gone? If the youth are going and gone, then we got to do something. Number two, and, and here where many of you may, may disagree. One of the signs of the health of a community, in my opinion, is converts and reverts. When you look at a community, no new people coming in, no converts, no reverts. How important is going after the people, the da'wah, how important? Allah will bring Noah and his people on Yom al Qiyamah. And Allah will ask Noah, Did you deliver the message? Message to who? Did you deliver the message? He said, Naam, Ya Rabb, I did. And then Allah will ask the people of Noah, Hal balakakum? Did he deliver the message? They will say, no one came to us. And Allah will ask Noah a strange question. Who will bear witness for you? Qala Muhammad. Ummatahu. Muhammad will bear witness for me and his ummah. And as a uh, honor given to the Prophet and this ummah, we will bear witness that Noah delivered the message. How many years did he preach? 950 years Noah preached. Oh Allah, I called on them night and day in secret and in open. Of the 950 years that he preached, how many converts? Hmm? About how many? Hmm? No, a little bit more than zero. Hmm? About 80. According to most historians, about 80. Which comes to this point. Allah did not put on you the responsibility of conversion. No one can believe except by the permission of Allah. And this is what Allah revealed in the Quran for some of you, your own children, your parents, and your neighbors. You can't get them. You can't guide whom you love, but Allah guides to the straight path whomever he pleases. 
Your job isn't to make conversion. Your job is to preach the truth. Children and uh, converts, reverts. I think Muslims have missed our calling for da'wah. And in my opinion, we have made a mistake in the way we do da'wah. I'm going to explain to you what I mean. We, in giving da'wah, have put ourselves different from the people. Yeah, we are different. But consider this. My thesis tonight is what I'm going to give to you right now. One of the things that prophets do, they prophesize. Listen to this prophecy of the Prophet The word tabi'a means to follow. Tabi'u, you will follow. But when you begin the sentence with a lamb called lamb al ibtida'a la, la tat tabi'una, la, la tat tabi'una, tat tabi'u, la tat tabi'una. That lamb, that L, means that it is uh, in intensity, surety. So he's saying, you will follow. Without a doubt, you will follow those who came before you. The sunnah, sanana ladina min qablikum. The sunnah of those who came before you, shibran bi shibran, step by step and inch by inch so that if they crawled in the hole of a lizard you would follow right behind them. You mean the Christians and the Jews for men, who else? So that's good news for us in some sense because we came later and we can observe the people came before us so that we don't make the same mistakes, right? Right? But yet he said, you will follow. Now help me a little bit. I need, I need your help. How many of you, like me, used to be a non-Muslim? Raise your hand. Okay, good. A handful of us. How many were Christians like me? Okay, good, good. I want you to go back to the Bible for a minute. When we were in the church, we used to read about prophets that we loved. But they, because the Bible was in English, the names of the prophet were English. So I need you to help me. I say the name in English, and you tell me the name of Arabic, the equivalent that you find in the Quran. Like, for instance, Jesus. Isa. Do you bear witness that the same name Jesus that's in the Bible is the same Isa in the Quran. You agree with that? Okay, good. Do you know Muslims with the name Isa? If you do, raise your hand. That's almost everybody. Do you love Isa? Of course you do. You take his, you take his name. You must love him. Moses. Musa. Do you find Muslims with the name Musa? A lot of them. Do you love Musa? Of course you do. You take his name. How about Aaron? Harun? You know Muslims with Harun? Love him? Respect him? I got one. You're not going to get this one. How about, how about David? Dawood? Muslims with the name Dawood? Solomon? Suleiman. Suleiman. Suleiman, Suleiman. Oh, this, I got this one. Not going to get it. Job. Ayub. You know Muslims with the name Ayub? How about Jonah? Eunice? 
No Muslims with the name Yunus. You see a trend here? How about John? Yahya. Muslims with the name Yahya? You, right? You see that? What do you learn here? Nobody can say anything about the Muslims in terms of our love for the prophets, for we carry their names. Indeed, the name Muhammad is the most common name in the world. And we love Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Everybody good? Good. The Prophet Sallallahu gave us a clue how we interact with the people of the book. Our Imam recited something in, uh, for Salat Aisha. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes if you remind me if I forget. Listen to what the Prophet said. My example and the example of the prophets who came before me is the example of a man who built a building. And the building is perfectly put together. And the people, they go around the building marveling at the beauty of the building, except there's one brick missing. A brick. And I am that brick. You get it? The building is put together almost perfectly. What's missing? A brick. I'm that brick. This is why the Imam said in the Salat, This day have I perfected for you your religion. Perfected. Not a new religion. How much did he add? He added a brick. The Prophet said, The Prophets, all of them are brothers. The mothers are different, but the religion is one. We have brought Islam as something foreign instead of the reality. And let me get to this point. I want you to understand this point. I'm going to, it's going to be very important. During the time of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, some Jews came to him because some Jews had committed zina, adultery. And so they came to the Prophet for judgment. The Prophet gave us the key. Ma tajiduna fi kitabikum. What do you find in your book? You're trying to tell them what the Quran say, and you should. That's not my point. But sometimes you have to ask them the question, what do your book say? If the Jews came to the Prophet for judgment, that's good, right? We go to the Prophet for judgment, right? That's good. They came to the Prophet for judgment. That's good, right? But Allah does something interesting in the Quran. Instead of praising them, he admonishes them like this. He's talking to the Prophet. Why do they come to you, Muhammad, for judgment? And they have the Torah. In it is the, is the judgment of Allah. What? Why? Because they didn't come to the Prophet for judgment. Because they respected his judgment. But to get away from the punishment that was in their own book. And Allah knew that. You're not coming because you accept him as the messenger of Allah. You're coming to circumvent what's in your book. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the people have lost their way. And our children are behind them. Where are they? Uh, a couple of years ago, I went on a, a, a plane. It's a large plane, and I was the last one on the plane. And my seat was all the way in the back. And I was able to look at everybody on both sides as I was walking in the back. And you know what I noticed? Everybody had a device. Everybody. Everybody have a, had a device, and they were on it. Young and old. This is a different generation. Our generation is different. 
Bear witness. So you the young guys, so there's no difference. Well, old guys like us, right? Huh? Bear witness, it's different. Um, my granddaughter, three years old, and uh, one day I was on my iPad, right? And I was trying to go on Wi-Fi. So my three-year-old daughter, granddaughter said, uh, Grandpa, what you doing? How do you explain to a three-year-old that you're trying to go on Wi-Fi, right? So I fumbled it. I said, you know, I'm trying to go here so I can go there. She said, Grandpa, are you being Wi-Fi? This generation is different. They watch TV, but not like before. You leave them alone on their iPad, they're good. But you gotta be careful where they're going. What's influencing them? I think I got the main thing that I want to get, and then I want to get into my, um, the beginning of my conclusion. What's going on in the world? You ever hear of um, um, who's the name of that that great historian, Arnold Toynbee? You ever hear of Arnold Toynbee? Arnold Toynbee is the greatest historian of our modern time. He said a few things. One of the things he said. Of the 22 civilizations that appeared, 19 of them collapsed when they reached the moral state that the United States is in now. Of the 22 civilizations that appeared, 19 of them collapsed when they reached the moral state that the United States is in now. You may not believe what I'm saying today, you may not understand it, but I'm telling you right now, the United States of America, our home, our house right now is dead men walking. But you know why people can't see it? Because they can't see. If you know scripture, you will bear witness easily that right now our country is on the brink Let me read a couple of things for you. I went to Norway this year. And for the first time in the history of Norway, there are more atheists than Christians. 39% of the population of Norway are atheists. Atheist. Sweden, there are 4,515,000 atheists. 46% of the population of Sweden are atheists. Netherlands, 6,769,000 atheists. 40% of the population, atheists. United Kingdom, 25 million. 920,000 atheists, 40% of the population atheists. Germany, 30,855,000 atheists, 38% of the population atheists. Japan, 58,342,000 atheists, 46% of the population atheists. China, 1 billion, 29 million atheists, 75% of the population atheist. That's happening all over the world, especially in Europe. Italy, it is predicted by the year 2050, 60% of the Italians will have no brothers, no sisters, no cousins, no uncles, and no aunts because they stop having babies. I told you one of the signs of deterioration, lack of children. Of the 22 nations with the 
with the um, highest rate highest birth or lowest birth rate 19 or 18 of them is in Europe meaning they're not having children some of that now is happening in the United States I went to um, Scotland this year we're down Main Street in Scotland. My driver, Naeem, we stopped at a light, and to my right was a huge church. One o'clock in the afternoon, I saw people going into the church. I said, Naeem, what, what denomination is that? So many people going into church one o'clock on a Saturday. He said, Imam, that's not a church. He said, it's a pub. A pub is a place where they sell alcohol. He said in UK they have a law. If something is built from the ground as a church, the structure can never be changed. You can put whatever you want there, but you can't change the structure. So as we went down Main Street, he said, Imam, look over there. He said, that, that's not a church, and that's not a church, and that's not a church, and that's not a church. Since 1960, 10 thousand churches in England has been closed and they said by next year another 4,000 closed what's going on people ain't going to church no more church is closing down all over not just in the Europe but also in the United States And you can fact check me, everything I'm giving you tonight. Um, Pastor James McDonald, an article called The Decline of the American Church, he said, of the 250,000 Protestant churches in America, 200,000 are either stagnant, or no growth, or declining. 3,500 people leave the church every single day. What about the Muslims? What about the Muslims? Where are your children? Look in the churches. We look in the masjids. Let's be real. Do you find more of our children staying or more leaving? But they're up here. <laughs> so we know they're here. <laughs> Let me share this with you. Everybody good? I got a few more minutes? Yes? Let me know. I can, I can leave right now. Someone said, yes, leave right now. Look at population trends. Russia, present population 133 million. By 2050, it will be 125 million decline. Germany, 80 million. By 2050, 78 million. Italy, 55 million. By 2050, 52 million. Meanwhile, give me any Muslim country. Name one Muslim country. Tanzania. Huh? Tanzania. 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 Okay, Pakistan. I'm the speaker. I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> Population of pa anybody from Pakistan? I want to let you know before I say this, I love you. Okay? We, we good? Pakistan population, 
204 million. By 2050, 344 million. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bangladesh. Anybody from Bangladesh? I really love you. 183 million by 2050, 265 million. Anybody from Turkey? Do you want Turkey or you don't want Turkey? You want Turkey? I'll give you Turkey. Turkey, population 79 million by 2050, 98 million. The population of the Ummah is growing. Saudi Arabia? I'll tell you later. So that's good. But what kind of quality? Every, in my opinion, every masjid must have a, um, they call it a youth director, major. You have to be concerned with the youth. Where are they? Where's our mind? Where the water? What's going on with the Muslims? Right now, it's good. The masjids are growing. It's good. Wherever you go, you see growth of the masjids in terms of numbers of masjids. But then when you look, gradually, the Muslims, especially the youth, are going. The da'wah. Our major job is da'wah. If, if I had one complaint with the Muslim Ummah, I would say the lack of going after the people. Alhamdulillah, our masjid has now a, we've had da'wah teams in the past, but we have now a more effective da'wah than we've ever seen. We intend, I'm telling you this, you can write it down and you can look to see. We intend, by Allah's help, to bring thousands of people to the masjid. We've gone all the areas of Brooklyn. We're looking around. Where are we going to go? Massive da'wah. Because that's our work. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if we uh, train our children, teach our children, and then go after the da'wah, our, our, our masters will continue to be vibrant. We are the Muslims. We have to make a difference. That means we have to commit ourselves with finances. I remember one year, I can be honest with you, Allah blessed me with nine children. All of them went to a Muslim school. Of my nine children, five are solid Muslims, four struggle. I wish every one of them were the best Muslims. But your job as a, as a father and a mother you can't guide them, except you can try. Give them the guidance, let them learn the way, help them do everything that you can. Don't ever give up on them. I never gave up on my children. So what are we gonna do? 95% Muslim children go to public school, a non-Muslim private school. One year, my children were going to a Muslim school, and my wife, she was very fed up with the school. She said, we got to take our kids out of the school, put them in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a um, public school. The school that I sent my children to, Long Island, I had to drive there every day, take them and bring them back and pay tuition. And they didn't give me a break because I'm the imam. They said, imam, you want to put your children in our school? Yes. MashaAllah. Give me the tuition. So I took them out because she insisted. I put them into a public school right around the corner from my house. Allah is my witness. I put them there not even half a day. I said, I can't do that. I was crying. I said, it's like putting sheep to the wolves. And I took them out. I found another Muslim school. You don't know what our children face. 
You put them in a public school, expect them to be good Muslims. I understand, if you have to put them in a public school, you have to monitor everything that they're doing, everything that they're getting. And when the school is over, you gotta have some kind of programs for them, some weekend programs, some evening programs, because if you don't, you're gonna lose them. You know why? Because of the nature of human beings. You know the nature of human beings? Human beings have to eat, they have to drink, but there's one other thing about human nature that maybe you didn't know. It is within human nature to belong, especially to the majority uh, uh, population, to be separate by yourself, different, is very difficult. I remember when I was seven years old, I was living in Marcy Projects. I never forget, seven years old, Sunday morning, getting ready to go to church, putting on my suit. I'm a Christian. And uh, I said to my mother, I said, Mom, why we got to go to church anyway? So my mother took out her belt. So you know, <laughs> see, you know, you're, you know where this is going. My mother took out her belt. And she whacked me a few times. Then she said, now you understand why you got to go to church? I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> but I didn't. So 12 years later, I left the church. Our children are asking us, why? Why? Why I got to put on a chemo? Why I got to do? Why can't I go to the prom? Why can't I have this friend? Why can't I do this? Why? And you are kind of, no, no, no. You can't do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do, that's what they hear from us. We can't do anything. So you got to remember that there is a substitute for everything. Whatever they have haram, we got halal. And we have to show them that going down that road is destructive. Now see, Allah give us, he give us a, uh, um, a head start. وَإِذَا كِيلَ لَهُمْ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا عَفَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ أَبَاءَنَا And when they said to them, follow what Allah has revealed, they said, no, 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 we will follow where we found our fathers. كُلُّ مَا لُوذًا يُلُدُوا عَلَى فِتْرَةً Every human being by nature is born a Muslim. And it's their parents that make them a Jew or Christian. I was a Christian. Not only was I a Christian, I was a Baptist. Why was I a Baptist? Because I studied it? No. I, became, I was a Baptist because my mother and father were Baptists. Had they been Jehovah Witness, I would have been Jehovah Witness. But for Muslims, the difficulty is this. You send them to a public school, handful of Muslims, and they look around, and they feel alone. Oh, man. Some of our daughters, I'm being honest with you, some of our daughters, they leave the home with the chemo on. They go a block away from home, take the chemo off because it's pressure. You call it peer pressure, but peer, peer pressure is real. You have to have strong iman. I give you an idea what I mean. This morning in the khutbah, I spoke about Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wa salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows everything. He recorded a conversation that Ibrahim had with his wife, Sarah. And listen to what he said. Yes, Sarah. Oh, Sarah, there's not one believer on the face of the earth other than you and me. Dr. Ahmed Saka, rahimullah, he told me he moved from Lebanon to Chicago. He said, Imam, I remember the first Eid Khutbah in Chicago. He said it was three people. Three people. They had to be special Muslims to be so few. Last year, I was in Birmingham, United Kingdom. They had the Eid prayer. And you know how many Muslims prayed in the Eid prayer park? 140,000. Birmingham, uh, Birmingham uh, UK. But when you send the children with little Iman, in a public school, you almost condemn them to lose their faith. So you got to work hard, you got to pray, and you got to work hard. We got to work together. 
So right now, Allah bless us. We still got them. Many of them, we still got them. See, you lucky. How old is he? Eight. Hmm? Eight. Eight years old. You so happy. Look at you, smiling. Wait till you get 18. <laughs> Serious. They got, their, they got their little minds. They, they, they got, even ask the mothers. You know how mothers dress up the kid? Soon they start saying, I don't want to wear that. Am I, am I right? I don't want... I don't want to wear that. Why I got to wear that? I don't want to wear that. They got their own little minds. And you know what? When they go to college, you got to be careful because the professors are telling them you got to check everything. And then many of them, they lose their faith in Allah because the professor is an atheist and many of the students, they become atheists. So my point tonight was to um, make you aware um, I'm learning more. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking now to the youth more than ever. Uh, there's a young uh, boy named Ali. He's about 19 years old now. When I used to go to Washington, D.C., a group of them, about six of them, after my program, would take me to some Muslim restaurant. We would hang out for hours. And um, he moved to California. And... Uh, he came to see me recently in my masjid. He said, Imam, I want to be honest with you. I said, what, Ali? He said, Imam, I hate going to Juma. I hate it. I said, why? He said, because they don't relate. Don't relate. You, they're sitting there listening to a khutbah that they don't know what to do with it. What are you, what, what are you, what are you talking about? So we got to talk to them. We have to talk to our children. They're dealing with some things, some issues in school that you never dreamed of. It's a different time now. So what my advice today is to at least sit down with them, to talk to them, say, listen, son, sit down. What's going on? And you have to uh, create an environment that they feel they can talk to you. I can talk to my dad. I can talk to my mom. You talk to children. And you're pretty good, except when you talk to your own children. And when you talk to your own children, you're judgmental, you're hard, you don't give them a chance. You know what my children I used to have, always do when they were young? Every once in a while, I ask the question, you, wanna, you still want to be a Muslim? Don't, don't be a Muslim because, see, I was the first Muslim in my family. I was the first generation Muslim. I was 19 years old when I became a Muslim. I'm clear why I became a Muslim, but most of our children are Muslims because... Two billion, 300 million Christians, most of them because they're parents. One billion, 800 million Muslims, many of them Muslims because their parents are Muslims. One billion Hindu because their parents Hindu. 500 million Buddhists because their parents. 15, 16 million Jews, Jews because their parents were Jews. But we have in America, uh, a choice and then sometimes they you know put the Islam down in my conclusion I've come to the conclusion and you have to understand me some of you are going to disagree with what I'm about to say what we see now is not an attack against Islam per se it's an attack against religion we're the last one standing everyone else giving in Everyone else do what you want to do. You can't, you can't do what we, you want to do. Can I be frank with you? My secretary, she, she buzzed my office uh, uh, last year and said, Imam, there's a brother on the side of the, Muslim, of the sisters. There's a brother. He's a brother. And so me and the, secre uh, the, uh, the security, Ali, we took him and brought him on the, the brother's side. He was a, a man dressed as a woman. He had came on, had a, had a dress. And I spoke to him nicely. I said, you're welcome to stay here, but you can't stay on the side of the sisters. You can't go to the sisters' bathroom. And we had a discussion. Um, and he cried, I remember. I, I felt for him. You've got to remember this, brothers and sisters. When you do dawah, who's coming? Who's coming to the masjid? Everybody. Prostitutes will come. Drug addicts will come. Drug dealers will come. Gang members will come. 
uh, transgender will come. What will you do when they come? You have to let them come, but you have to keep the boundaries. This is what you can do we, as best we can. I was speaking to one of the brothers. We had a, we had a program um, recently, and, um, and we have to find ways to accommodate them. One man said, uh, he said in California, he said, uh, I'm not comfortable. He, he was born a man and now considers himself female. And, he's, and they said, well, you can, co- you can come use the men's bathroom. And then he said, I don't, I don't feel comfortable. He said, no problem. We have a special bathroom just for you. You can come to this bathroom. Accommodation, because people are going to come. You're going to stop them from coming? No, no. You, Dawa, this is the hospital. People are sick. This is a hospital. You have to accommodate them without changing your faith. It's, it's crazy now. It's, it's like ludicrous. Do you know, like Miss America and Miss Universe and stuff like that? Do you know that right now Miss Spain is a man or a person who was born man? I'm, t- I'm not saying this really to mock or anything like that, but I'm telling you things are different. Mattel is the biggest maker of children's to- toys. They got a new, let me see if I have it. I may have it. Times Magazine. It can be a boy, a girl, neither or both. And these are the dolls that they're making now. Because not only are they liberal and allowing people to do what they want to do, but they're promoting it. That's the danger. If you remember years ago, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, years ago, it was unheard of. People would hide themselves in the closet, but it's not like that no more. And not only do you have to accept it, accept it is one thing, and then you have to, you know, it's difficult. Our children are faced with tremendous difficulty. I ain't giving up. I know you want me, you want me to give you a lot of, of answers. I don't accept to say you got to do it and you got to talk to your children. You got to connect with your children and you have faith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum. Listen.